Hey, what's up YouTube? I just finished my rheumatology rotation and I wanted to just make a quick video talking about lupus, specifically how you can determine if the patient you're seeing is having a lupus flare because that's something I'm gonna be dealing with a lot as a hospitalist next year. So one of the things that I really uh, appreciated on this rotation is the importance of knowing a rheumatologic review of systems, uh, particularly a, a couple of symptoms very quickly off the bat that you can ask the patient, you know, if they're coming into the hospital, are they having increased joint pains or a new rash, uh, hair loss, ulcers in their mouth or any other mucosal areas? These are probably some of the key questions that are very simple that I'm going to ask patients in the future because it takes no time to ask these questions. And in the absence of any of these symptoms, if the patient is coming in with some kind of infection or something and there's some... Uh, concern that there may be a lupus flare, if they're not having any of these symptoms, it makes it a lot less likely that they're having a lupus flare. Obviously, there are a ton more symptoms that lupus can cause. For example, it can cause uh, any sorts of vague nonspecific symptoms like fevers, fatigue, and night sweats dry eyes and dry mouth, Raynaud's ph phenomenon. And obviously, if you're just trying to like make a diagnosis of possible lupus, you would go through a whole you know, extensive review of you know, any cardiac symptoms, any lung symptoms like chest pain with breathing, pleuritis, uh, any signs of interstitial lung disease, uh, any kidney problems. And I'm sorry, I'm drawing these... I guess all these orchids kind of look the same right now. Um, uh, you know, photosensitivity, blood clots, miscarriages, all of these things are things you can ask about. And I'm going to draw a brain here just to, uh, you know, go over the um, neurologic symptoms that could happen. And then low blood counts uh, can also be something that you might see. But going back to that patient that's admitted, uh, if I'm suspicious of a possible lupus flare contributing, uh, then I'm also going to get serologies, right? And the main ones that you're going to be looking for in terms of a possible lupus flare is you're going to want to see a decreased C3 and C4 for your complement levels, and you're going to see an increase in your anti-DS DNA. And this was a very useful rotation for me because I realized that, uh, you know, DS DNA is not only a pretty specific marker for lupus, but you can use it to track the d disease activity. And so I saw a patient who was recently hospitalized and their DSDNA was like 14,000. And then after they left the hospital, it went down to like 22 or something. So it actually can go pretty high in terms of its disease activity. Uh, and then also you can check ESR and CRP as well, which would be really just useful screening tests for you to check uh, before you consult uh, rheumatology. Now, if you're trying to just make a diagnosis of lupus in general, there are a whole host of antibodies that you really should be sending off. So uh, one key one that they send off is the ANA, and it doesn't always come with a titer. So sometimes you want to send this ANA HEP2, and uh, what you're looking for is a titer greater than 1 to 80 generally. And then you can also send everything for Sjogren's, for example, SSA, SSB. If you want to check for concomitant rheumatoid arthritis, you can send your, send your RF and anti-CCP. Really important to also send off all the uh, anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome uh, you know, rheumatologic studies. For example, the lupus anticoagulant, um, the anti-cardiolipin, and the anti-beta-2 glycoprotein. A urinalysis with a urine protein to creatinine ratio is very important to check just because so much of lupus can cause kidney involvement and you can get lupus nephritis. So that should be sent on everybody. And then other things you consider sending are what you know we call an extended myositis panel, which sends off a whole bunch of different antibodies. Um, you can also send uh, anti-URNP, which checks for mixed connective tissue disease, and anti-SCL70, which checks for um, uh, kind of a, a systemic sclerosis picture. Oh yeah, and then also you can finally send off ANCA serologies to check for a potential vasculitis component. I forgot also <laughs> one more, there's just so many antibodies here, but anti-Smith is also helpful for uh, checking for the presence of lupus. Again, another specific, but not sensitive uh, antibody for lupus. And then in general, they also recommend that you really kind of rule out infections that could be causing, you know, this joint pain, rash, you know, picture. Uh, and so things like uh, parvovirus, 
just to rule out some of these infections. Hepatitis B and HCV, these are all useful to rule out when you're trying to make an initial diagnosis of lupus. But again, going back to the main part of this video is that if you are trying to see if a lupus flare is causing uh, you know, this patient's admission, you really want to look for some cl clinical evidence of uh, the lupus. So they should be getting worsening joint pains, hair falling out everywhere, ulcers and rashes, um, and then also some serologic evidence of inflammation. For example, the elevated ESR, CRP, elevated DSDNA, and the decreased complement levels. Now, zooming out, uh, just talking a little bit more about the diagnosis of lupus, uh, we have uh, this uh, ACR 2019 criteria for the diagnosis of uh, lupus. So this ACR 2019. And um, you'll see all of the points here are going to be what you use to diagnose lupus. And what you need to do is get greater than 10 points in order to make a formal diagnosis. One of the th key things to note is that you need to have an ANA titer of greater than 1 to 80 as an entry criterion in order to uh, actually use this criteria. And you must have at least one of your points is from the clinical domain. Uh, but you have these two domains, the clinical domain and the immunologic domain. And so basically, you add up all these points here. You just kind of you know assess all of this. And this is why you get the antiphospholipid antibody domain you know studies. You get the complements, and you get the DSD DNA and anti-Smith. So any of these, you add them up, and if it's greater than 10, you can make the formal diagnosis of uh, lupus. Now, really briefly talking about treatment. So um, one of the things that you will find is that all patients should be on hydroxychloroquine. Generally, this is at a dose of 5 mg per kilogram. Uh, and then it, you're going to see typical doses anywhere from 200 to 400 milligrams because it comes in a 200 milligram tablet. For flares, you're going to be considering uh, steroids, such as prednisone. Uh, and some people really do need some maintenance prednisone, like 5 milligrams a day, uh, as well as NSAIDs. Uh, but I just want to say that if somebody's coming in with a severe flare into the hospital, you may consider uh, what's called pulse dose steroids. And this is very, very high dose steroids. For example, IV methylprednisolone at one milligram, uh, sorry, one gram per day. And uh, you do that for like three days if they have a really, really bad flare and it just really lowers the inflammation a lot. So one gram a day. And that's something that's important to know if you're potentially going to treat somebody for a severe lupus flare in the hospital. Um, just knowing the relative dosing of, of the IV methylprednisolone you're going to give. So for example, if somebody comes in with uh, a COPD exacerbation, frequently in the ED they give IV methylprednisolone like 125 or something milligrams. And so when you're treating these people for lupus flare, you're giving them a whole gram uh, for multiple days. It's a very, very high dose of steroids. And then finally, uh, down the line, you start thinking about some steroid sparing agents. So uh, especially if patients are not tolerating hydroxychloroquine or not tolerating chronic prednisone, which obviously has tons of side effects. Um, and these are things like belimumab, which again, all of these are immunosuppressants. So this one affects your uh, B lymphocytes and kind of suppresses their activity. Uh, azathioprine, which affects the purine you know, metabolism. You may consider mycophenolate. And then as things are getting worse, you may think about even stronger immunosuppressants such as cyclophosphamide or rituximab. Anyways, I hope this short video was helpful. Really, the main point of this video was to go over what are some of the questions you should ask a patient when they're coming into the hospital to determine if they're having a flare or not. And then just, you know, a basic interpretation of some of the inflammatory markers and lupus serologies that you're going to be taking a look at when the patient is hospitalized. I did think it was interesting knowing the official, you know, diagnostic criteria for lupus, you know, having the 2019 ACR guidelines. So that's definitely a helpful resource to look into and gives you a whole host of different questions you can ask your patient as well. And remember, as always, lupus can basically cause anything, um, as you probably are well aware of. And this is what makes it such an interesting di uh, disease, but also uh, a very difficult one to kind of tease out if certain problems are associated with the lupus. So for example, it's very frequent that you're gonna have a patient coming in with a pleural effusion or a pericardial effusion. And the question oftentimes is, is this a lupus flare or is this related to some other process like volume overload? And uh, you know, in the absence of all of those signs that I talked about earlier, it's probably less likely lupus and maybe related to some other disease process that's going on. So again, I hope this was helpful. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.